Yes, right. Yeah. So we, two, of the, two words isn't enough, or two expressions isn't enough, so we've got three expressions. So um, if, if the two of you would like to both be up there, there is another chair, but if you were going to tag team, um, that's fine too. And Jill, if you, once you're comfortably seated there, um, I think we've got a presentation that's going to be up on the screen, and it's also available on our uh, committee page. But before we launch into that, uh, after you've introduced yourselves to us, we'll go around and just quickly tell you who we are. You should slide over because if someone comes oh. in, we're going to talk. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That works. Like Sounds safety. like to you. So <laughs> yeah. Some <laughs> 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 experience. <laughs> How's that? That's much better. Okay, thank you. And we did send this along, so it should be. And it's real. It's real broad strokes. I I find it helpful to have. Um, I'll log on to the Zoom in just a moment. But uh, while I'm loading, um, my name is Jill Remick. I I have I'm getting over a cold, which I did not want to share with you. Hence the mask. So thanks for bearing with me. I'll try to speak clearly. Um, I'm the Director of Property Evaluation and Review, which is a division of the Vermont Department of Taxes. And we basically do everything related to administering the statewide education property tax system. So we have field staff that work with town listers and assessors. Uh, we do the statewide equalization study, which <coughs> helps calculate the tax rates. And then we also, um, for the purposes of today's discussion, um, we have a team that manages the current use program or the use value appraisal program. And Elizabeth is the uh, manager of that program. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm Elizabeth Hunt. I manage the current use program within the tax department. Um, and I say within the tax department because we have a number of other important partners that we uh, basically administer this program with, uh, including Forest Parks and Recreation through their county forester program. And then we also work very cooperatively with the town listers um, who provide the valuation and also the town clerks who manage some of our recording information for current use applications. Great. Um, we, I'll just say, uh, by way of background, we have had a few sort of casual conversations or references to current use in the, in the conversations that we've had so far this session, but we haven't really dug into it. And there may be folks on the committee uh, who uh, aren't sure what it is how it works uh, so 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 that would be good yeah. uh, that could be uh oh, it's us. You, you, you guys okay um, it's, so the presentation that jill and i put together the first part of it deals with sort of the numbers in the background and jill will do that part of the presentation and then i'll jump into sort of how do you qualify for current use you know what's the category so you'll get sort of both the numbers and the programmatic end of it and okay. then uh, okay, uh, we'll go around uh, and introduce ourselves, starting with Representative Graham. Um, <clears throat> Rodney Graham, I represent Orange 3, which is Williamstown in Chelsea. Jed Lipsky, I represent Lamoille 1, Stowe. Henry Pearl, I represent <coughs> Danville, Peachum, and Cabot. Charles Wilson, I represent Caledonia 3, which is uh, Linden, Sheffield, Wheelock, Sutton, I'm David Templeman from Orleans 3, which includes Westmore, Barton, and Bronington. Josie Levitt, um, Grand Isle Chittenden, all of Grand Isle County, and a little part of West Milton. Mike Rice, Bennington, Rutland District, Danby, Dorset, Land Grove, Mount Tabor, and Peru. Don O'Brien, Windsor Orange 1, that's Royalton and Windsor, Cambridge. Esme Cole, Windsor 6, Hartford. Heather Supernaut, Windsor 4, Barnard, Pomford, and Bridgewater. Thank you. And David Durfee, uh, Shaftesbury, Bennington, and Glossenbury. And thank you for being with us. Yeah, thank you for having us. So, um, yeah, so like I said, this is a real, real broad stroke setting the table on what current use is and isn't. So it will inevitably, I'm sure, come up in your committee. Um, I've been with the department since 2015. Elizabeth's been there longer. <laughs> so I, I thought it would be really helpful to have her as the administrator of the program in case you folks have specific details you want to get into. But overall current use, um, this program has been in place in one way or another since the late 70s and early 80s. Um, it started as a working lands program and has evolved 
But if you want to read the statutory language about it, it's, um, it's chapter 124 in Title 32. So Title 32 is all the taxation-related statutes. And it has a very clear statutory purpose. It's very much aimed at um, preservation, about protecting Vermont's working landscape, um, ensuring equitable taxation, and sort of planning for an orderly growth. Um, and so this sort of overall statutory construct guides the administration of the program. And in essence, um, Elizabeth and her team are reviewing and processing both enrollments, changes to enrollment, additions to enrollment, withdrawals, and also just regular maintenance of the program. I have one of my slides that just shows all the different partners that her team works with because it is not the way that maybe our income tax processing goes. You get a piece of paper, you review it, looks good, move on. Current use has a lot of folks involved in the administration because it involves local listers and assessors. It involves forestry and forestry management. It has very specific um, requirements for eligibility for things like agriculture. Um, and so we'll get into that. So the idea is essentially there's a current use advisory board. That's again, part of the, the statutory construct made up of a combination of um, appointees such as commissioner of tax, a representative of forest parks and recreation, um, members from the listing, assessing, and municipal uh, governance um, sectors. It has to have a specific makeup, so it's not weighted too heavily and people who all have land and are enrolled in the program or not. And the current use advisory board makes rules that oversee the program. And they also meet every year, they just did, I think last week, to set the use value. So the way current use works essentially is a landowner who wants to enroll their land in the program applies to have their land enrolled in the program and Elizabeth will get into all the different specific ways that folks can be eligible. And in exchange for having your land enrolled in the program, there's a lien placed, a contingent lien placed on the property and you'll pro your property tax bill will actually reflect to getting taxed those use values rather than fair market value. So the idea is that it is a substantial property tax savings if you're enrolled because you're paying at this use value that the current use advisory board pays rather than whatever the fair market value is of your particular property. So very broad strokes, that's that's the piece of the, the pie that makes it a property tax benefit program. Um, as you can imagine, along with everything else related to real estate over the last few years, um, we continue to see a lot of processing needs for current use. We had record numbers of applications. A lot of them were transfers, right? Property, there's only so many acres that can be eligible in Vermont. A lot of that property changed hands. Um, but right now we're up to more than 19,000 parcels in Vermont enrolled in the program, which is a little bit more than a third of Vermont's overall acreage. And as you can see, the, there are owners obviously who have more than one parcel in the program. Um, there are owners who are both in-state and out-of-state owners. The total forested acres, as you can imagine, if you look at a, a you know, GIS map of Vermont, it's a lot of forest land, um, but then the total acreage is a little over 2.5 million enrolled in the program. <clears throat> Farm buildings, again, have pretty specific reasons they can be eligible. Instead of having a use value assigned to them on your property tax bill, they're taxed at 0% fair market value. So as you can imagine, farm buildings range for everything from like, um, you know, very small sheds to high-end sugar processing, dairy processing, things like that. So there's a pretty wide range of farm buildings. Um, the total value of enrolled farm buildings in the latest tax year um, was $307 million. And if any of you want to dig further into any of this, I've got links at the end of this to our annual report. So we have a town by town breakdown of uh, the savings, the value of, of enrolled um, acreage, value of enrolled farm buildings, and so on, broken out by town in our annual report. <clears throat> so we often get asked, what are the taxation impacts of this? So um, the this part of the statutory construct is that municipalities should not be penalized financially for having land enrolled in the program. So the idea is that basically based on what our enrollment is and the various tax rates in different municipalities, we calculate a hold harmless payment that goes out to the towns every year that essentially um, covers up the difference of what municipal tax revenue would have been. I think there might've been a concern, especially at the beginning when current use was fully administered at the local level, that it was a disincentive for a town to have land in the program because they were gonna miss out on their municipal revenue. So this is a way to correct that. So that's a payment that goes out annually uh, from the general fund. And this year it was about $18 million. Another question we get asked is um, about property tax revenue, certainly, because the idea is that you're paying on that use value, not on fair market value. 
Um, so the foregone education fund revenue is about $47 million in this last dollar figure. So the total savings to landowners is a little over $65 million between municipal taxes and um, education taxes. And as we like to say, Elizabeth is always <laughs> reminding me, we haven't captured the economic impact of things like forest and agriculture, which are significant, right? So keeping that in mind when we talk about maybe the Ed Fund hasn't made that, but we also have sales and use and other things that pay into the education fund that um, certainly can be attributed to some of our far forestry and farm um, economy. So again, so like I said, uh, current use administration involves a lot of individuals, it involves the landowners who are making that decision to enroll. Um, the landowners usually get help from consulting foresters, especially if they're, um, they're, they have forest land in the program, they have a specific requirements, they have to meet forest parks and recreation. Uh, we deal with a lot of real estate attorneys, right, because folks at closings, or if they're considering selling or purchasing property, they want to know the implications. Uh, Liz's team works closely with the county foresters at Forest Parks and Recreation, because they actually oversee the forest management plans and the administration and approval of forest management activity. Um, so they have a pretty significant um, role in overseeing current use program. Uh, we also have a small team of five of us. Hard to say. We've had, you know, we have kind of a revolving door, but we've got people coming and going. But we have a small team of specialists at um, PVR is property valuation and review, um, and they do all the oversight of map review, enrollment, enrollment management, uh, withdrawals, things like that. They're they're the they're the hub of the current use um, administration. Um, like I mentioned, the current use advisory board is made up of folks who have land in the program, folks who don't, local officials, representatives from agriculture, forest, parks and recreation, and tax. Um, our other significant partner in the program are the local listers and assessors. So they have to review each of these enrollments. They have to help us confirm grand list acreage. They have to help us confirm things like buildings, um, boundaries, uh, and then they have to actually set the value of the land because we have to know what the fair market value is to calculate that difference. And then town clerks are responsible because current use also requires um, recordings for the contingent lien, removal of the lien, and so on. So um, we have a lot of folks that we're working with on a day-to-day -day basis. Can I pitch it to you for a moment? You can pitch it to me for a moment. Um, so uh, this slide here, there's a lot of information on here. This is made up numbers, yeah. um, but I did pull them from a real parcel and then fudged them a little bit. So you couldn't figure out who it was. Um, and the use value calculations are slightly old too. Um, so why would somebody enroll in current use? Say you have 98 acres of ag and forest land with two acres excluded because you have to have two acres excluded around a house. You can now have multiple houses on that two acre site uh, that changed a couple years ago to encourage cluster development. So they didn't have to have two acres for each house, which has been great. Um, so in this example, say the enrolled land value was 185,000, the excluded land value was 40,000. So this landowner is gonna pay regular taxes on that $40,000 because it's not enrolled in the program, it's excluded. But for the $185,000 of enrolled land value, um, if the tax rate is 2.5212, which is, well, until last year may have been a reasonable tax rate, um, the exempt reduction is $167,900. That's that use value calculation. So we brought the grand list value down because of that use value of what the ag and forest land is. We've lowered that value of what they're being taxed at. So without current use, they'd be taxed on $225,000 in value. So they'd have a tax bill on the on that 98 acres of $5,673. With current use, the taxes are based upon that $57,100 value times the tax rate divided by 100. So they're only gonna pay $1,440 in taxes. So in this example, they save $4,233 on their taxes. That's why people come into current use. Keeping in mind, they're still gonna pay regular property taxes on that $40,000 of their two acres of excluded land they're still gonna pay regular property taxes if there happens to be a house on this property. If they would have farm buildings enrolled on this property and I didn't wanna make it too complicated, they don't pay any tax on those farm buildings. Okay, this one, thank you. 
Um, so why wouldn't somebody be enrolled in the program? I get this question a lot, particularly for new landowners. Like, well, why would I want to be in the program? But also, why wouldn't I want to be in the program? What's it? Why not? Some people don't want to lien pay placed on their property. That just has some negative connotations for them. Um, there's the cost to prepare the application materials and any updates. Um, so again, if your land value is not that high, then that amount of your savings is going to be that much lower because you're going to be closer in that use value. So if the cost to prepare the application and the materials and the maps is pretty high, you may not have a lot of tax savings. Um, if the land is developed at any point in time, the land use change tax becomes due. Um, this is now a significant amount of money in a lot of cases. Um, the formula to calculate this was changed by the legislature in 2015. So we've seen a pretty big increase um, in that. So that, depending upon how you may want to use the property in the future or people are concerned about it, they may not do it. Um, forest land requires that a forest management plan be developed. Uh, it, you, the landowner can do it, but in most cases, a licensed forester is going to develop that, which means the landowner has to hire them have that prepared and then the county foresters who work for the department of forest parks and recreation have to review and approve that plan and then the landowner is required to follow that plan which may be regular harvesting it may be dealing with invasive species um, the landowner does have a choice on how they want to manage their land are they going to manage it um, for firewood are they going to manage it for saw wood? and it's also based on what the inventory of those trees are so it's a conversation with the landowner and their consulting forester and then that review and approval process. Um, agricultural land in buildings do not have that same process of having a management plan prepared, but they do now need to turn in an annual certification that we send out to them that says that they are still in active agricultural use and they qualify for enrollment. There we go. So um, let's talk about what can be enrolled for forest land. Um, for forest land enrollment, at least 25 acres of enrolled land, exclusive of house site and developed areas, um, with a minimum of 20 acres of productive managed forest. Um, and I'm just gonna also add an aside that this slide does not represent any changes that are coming because of the reserve forest land. That doesn't take effect until July 1st. So that's not yet in here. This is what exists as of today. Um, you have to have that forest management plan with a map prepared. Um, lands where timber is not a principal objective may be enrolled for ESTAs, which you may have heard about with the conversations about the reserve forest land from last year, um, significant wildlife habitat, the special places, sensitive sites. These are all sort of subcategories that the landowner can use. Um, and then site class four lands are all eligible with minor caveats. Um, site class four is, um, it's not capable of producing 20 cubic feet per wood per acre per year. This is why we let the county foresters review this because they know how to measure all of these things. And um, then there's one exception to the forest land enrollment. If the owner of the land is a qualified farmer, and I'll talk about what that is in the next slide, um, you can have unlimited site class forest, forest land enrolled and up to 25 acres of productive forest land can be enrolled without a management plan. So special criteria for those people who earn at least, 50, the owner has to earn 50% of their gross income from the business of farming. So agricultural land and buildings can be enrolled in the program. It's considered an active agricultural use. If they're pasturing livestock, they're growing crops, harvesting hay, orchard, they produce an annual maple product. There's some other small caveats if you have, um, trees or vines that are fruit producing that are not yet of bearing age, that's also eligible. Uh, we also uh, now allow um, if it's a um, stream and there is a buffer required by the agency of ag through their regulations that can be enrolled as active agricultural use. So people don't have to farm all the way up to the stream that can still be enrolled in the program. Um, if you want to enroll less than 25 acres, the owner must be a qualified farmer, somebody who earns 50% of their gross income from the business of farming as defined by an IRS regulation, or they can have a written three-year lease with someone who's a qualified farmer, or the land has to earn $2,000 a year from the sale of farm crops. So there are some qualifications. 
Otherwise, it has to be 25 acres in size. So more than 25 acres, it just needs to be in one of those active ag uses. <clears throat> Less than 25 acres, you have to meet one of those three income qualifications and be an active ag use. Um, there's that annual ag certification. That's a one page certification form says it's still an active agricultural use. Um, and any ag buildings that are uh, to be enrolled in the program have to be an active agricultural use and either the owner of the land has to be a qualified farmer or the buildings have to be leased to a qualified farmer. So Jill touched on this development. So when you enroll your land in the program, there's a contingent lien placed upon that land. That contingent lien is there to ensure payment of the land use change tax should it become due and the owner doesn't pay. So what is development? And development's a little unique in current use. It is what you might think. You build a house, two acres are developed around your house unless you've done that cluster development in an existing two acre exclusion. Um, you, if you create a parcel less than 25 acres, if I have a 40 acre parcel and enrolled in the program and I sell off 15 acres, that 15 acres is considered development. So if you create a parcel less than 25 acres, it's developed, the land use change taxes do. Um, there's an exception if it's to an immediate family member and the immediate family member re-enrolls that land. So it has to be meet those income qualifications of the less than 25 acre parcel. Uh, if you cut contrary to your forest management plan, so your forest management plan says, I'm only gonna control invasive species and you do more than that. Um, if the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation does an inspection and they've determined you cut contrary to your forest management plan, they'll report that to us. The portion that is cut contrary is considered developed. The land use change tax is due on it. And then all of your remaining forest land is also removed from the program for five years. If you construct any building, road, or other structure in mining, excavation, or landfill activity, those are considered development, and the land use change tax will be due on the portion of the land that's developed. Uh, unless you're using those things for farming, logging, forestry, or conservation purposes. Um, and um, the final one is agricultural land where there's a water quality violation reported um, by the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets to the Department of Tax. That one's got a whole lot of processes that need to be followed before they come out of enrollment. So this land use change tax. So the land use change tax is due upon development of the land or if the landowner wants to remove the lien. So if you just wanna get the lien off your land, maybe you intend to sell it at some point in time. Maybe you're a new owner, you don't wanna be involved in current use. You don't want the lien on the land, you want it to come out. So in either case, the land use change tax has to be paid. Um, the land use change tax is 10% of the fair market value of the land. And the value is the land as if it were a separate parcel on the grand list. So if you're gonna take out, say you're gonna take out five acres of land, you're gonna send us a map, show us where that five acres is. We ask the local assessing official to determine the value of that five acres as if it were a separate parcel on the grand list. That gets divided by the CLA for the town. The CLA is, um, in very simple terms, is a ratio of what things are assessed at in town versus what they're selling at. So it just sort of equalizes that value. Um, and then it's 10% of that value that's determined. So if the town says it's $50,000, your CLA is at one, your tax is gonna be $5,000. And the municipality, because this changed in 2015, the municipality is doing that valuation. So in 2015, when we changed how that calculation works, um, it was determined that they received 50% of the land use change tax that is collected up to $2,000. Okay, my turn again. <laughs> Good, I don't know what this one says. And we, we do have a separate um, sort of presentation articulation of some of the current challenges with the land use change tax. We certainly didn't want to dump it in here on our building some foundational understanding, but we would love to come back and talk to you folks about that. Um, just about what we're finding as far as the uh, treatment of various taxpayers, the difficulties in administering that and whether it's actually had the intended impact or not. Um, it's, it's proven pretty challenging, but this is what it is as of right now. Um, I figured I was reminded last night, I should remind folks, if you see um, in the governor's budget, 
we are asking permission to use money that is actually supposed to be in the, the current use administration fund um, to help us with some digitization in the program. So specifically, we have um, there, I can't remember if it's from a property transfer tax return or where exactly it comes from, um, but the current use program has an administrative set aside that was supposed to be coming to our program for modernizing and, and supporting the program. Um, and so we are asking permission to use some of that money. There is a surplus in there to help us digitize our current use records, to upgrade our um, application system. Um, we have been able to get some pretty snazzy, hopefully, they haven't actually all shown up yet, some equipment, because right now we're still very paper reliant. We are um, we are reliant on paper maps because they need to meet a certain scale and we have to send them to the towns. Um, it's still, uh, and so this all creates a lot of paper and a lot of files. And so we would like to be able to scan those and digitize them so that we can have us and our staff access them easily. Um, we've got two full file rooms right now um, and staff, if they want to look back and see, because as you can imagine, since this program has been in place for a long time, there are multiple generations of maps for any given parcel. And we have to keep track of where the lien still is, where the lien isn't, and so on. And so those are all kept right now on paper files. So we would like to digitize those. So, um, and then, like I said, there's lots of information. Where we're happy to walk through any of these pieces, but these were the three big ones that I wanted to make sure I share with you folks today. Um, as we talked about earlier, there's a significant portion of the um, enrollment that goes through Forest Parks and Recreation, so they have some very handy um, guidance on their webpage. Um, there's mapping standards that we share with them for the program. We also, as I mentioned, have the PBR annual report that just came out in January. If you go on our website, it looks kind of like this, and I'm happy to, to um, send the direct links in there. Are, um, there's not only a really handy summary and graph of sort of how current use has changed over time that Elizabeth has created, but also there are links to the data about how each town, um, you know, the, the impact of current use in each town. Um, and then there's also, um, I thought it'd be helpful to show you folks sort of the how you apply, what you need to do to apply, what the maps are that you need to provide, things like that. So those are, I wanted to make sure I shared those with you folks as well. Um, and I think that was it for our formal presentation. And I think we're happy to answer any questions. We, we do have questions, I can tell already. Representative <laughs> Graham. <laughs> Going back to the qualification part, um, in, in today's times, a lot of, especially these small and to medium-sized firms, have off-firm income. And off-farm income a lot of times rises a much faster than on-farm income. It won't rise much. So it, you can easily get into the issue of not being 100% on-farm. But if you don't have the off-farm income, you don't have any farm income. So, it, it, you know, is that something that you could be looking into or should be looking into or is there any way to change it? Um, you want me to yeah, go for it. I was going to find the statute. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple things with that. Um, one is that uh, what, what I see a lot of times because I look at those applications and uh, it is the gross income from the business of farming. So not the bottom line, but halfway down your schedule F that counts for is it 50% of your gross income? Um, and then the other thing that we see that a lot of people do because one, you know, if it's a couple, uh, one spouse will work off the farm, it gives you health insurance, more steady income, um, is we do see people that um, the spouses will lease to one spouse. So you can lease to another person and that's sort of the workaround when you have somebody who's working, one person who's working on the farm, so you lease to the person who's actually doing the farming, they've got the farm income and the farm business. Or uh, another thing that's more common nowadays is there's also an LLC form to do the farming. So it may be the land is owned by individuals and the farming is done under the LLC. And then the lease can be done to the LLC. And because we're looking at the lease's income, if the LLC is only doing farming, then they can qualify as a farmer. So it is possible to jump through those hoops, assuming that the LLC is earning farm income. Okay. Yeah. So that, the, we'll get to you in a second. Okay. Just, 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 <clears throat> those hoops sound like they're not uh, necessarily straightforward and easy to jump through. 
uh, you know, paperwork, legal expenses, and so forth. Is does the department feel that there should be another look at the fifty percent, or has has that not been uh, a topic of conversation? We. I would say we haven't had that conversation and and keep in mind that that 50% income only comes into review when you want to enroll farm buildings and the state is covering 100% of your taxes on that farm building or if you have a less than 25 acre parcel. Um, if you have more than 25 acres, then you don't need to do that income qualification. So it really is for just those small parcels that it comes into play or if you want to enroll farm buildings where we're covering 100%. So. Um, uh, and, and the other thing I would say is for a lease, um, the lease has to meet some very minimal qualifications for us. Um, I see a wide range of leases. Some of them are two sentences long and some of them are 20 pages. So um, that's up to the landowner as to how they want to structure that lease. And we do have a fact sheet online to help people understand what sort of are the minimum qualifications for that lease. Thank, thank Try and make it easy for people if we can. Representative Levitt. Oh, I just had a, sort of a two-pronged question about the, the having a lien on the on the property. Mm -hmm. What if you own your property outright? And what effect does having the lien have on your credit? Okay. Um, so a couple things. The important thing to remember <coughs> is it's a contingent lien. What does that even mean? So um, typically when you have a <laughs> lien on your land, um, it may be, say, maybe you owe $20,000 to somebody, and they're gonna put a lien on your land for $20,000. Um, what we found out, I can't remember when we changed it, 12, 2012? Yeah, wasn't that long ago. Wasn't that long ago, but it was long ago. We were finding that some people were having troubles uh, with their mortgages on the secondary market to the federal um, Freddie and Fannie because they didn't understand what a current use lien was. A current use lien is not for a specific amount. It just says your land is enrolled in current use, you agree to have a lien placed upon the land, and, and if you ever develop it, the land use change tax shall be due and the lien is there to ensure payment. So Got it's it. not for a specific amount. So um, when we recognize that, that people were having trouble uh, getting mortgages that could be sold on the secondary market, we changed it. We worked with the real estate bankers um, and a variety of other people, changed the statute to call it a contingent lien. So it was clear that it wasn't an actual lien. Got it. Okay. If the tax becomes due and they don't pay it, then we can put a real lien on the land. So um, it doesn't really matter if they have a mortgage or not. Um, and because it's a contingent lien, that seems to have solved the problem with the mortgages. I just hear the word lien and I think, oh, that's bad. Yes. So thank you. That, that, yes. that's, totally and that's why we talk it. about a contingent, although I sometimes still just say lien because I've, I've never heard of a contingent lien before. Yeah. But thank you. That so makes perfect not, sense. Not a specific amount. There's nothing due. It's just there as a guarantee of payment to the tax. To the state. Okay. Does Thank you. Help? Yeah, very much. Thank you. Other questions? Representative O'Brien. Um, a couple, maybe. Um, one thing I've always been confused about is you can use a pearl farm as an example. So if you have, say, 500 acres, a certain amount is open cropland, hay, pasture, whatever, and you have a certain amount of forest, and you qualify, say, as a certified small farmer. Does current use um, list that acreage differently? You know, there's a value that they assign to agricultural land and a value they assign to forest land. Mm -hmm. And so how does that work with these certified farmers versus somebody who is not a farmer? Is it a different rate? No. So the current use advisory board sets the use value rates. There is a use value rate, and there are statewide rates. Um, there's a use value rate for agricultural enrollment, agricultural land that's enrolled. There's a use value rate for forest land that's enrolled. And then there's a third use value rate for forest land that's greater than a mile from a class one, two, or three road. Because it's far away, different value. Um, and those acreages are based upon that map that you turn into current use. So if you have 27 acres of ag land, then you get the use value of 27 acres of ag land, 50 acres of forest, you get the use value on 50 acres of forest. So that's why those maps are important is because they translate to, to that. And then it's the town that determines the value of that overall enrolled land. Usually the towns don't break it out between this is what the ag land is valued at 
and this is what the forest land is valued at, they have what they call a bulk land rate. So you'll have your two acre house site value. You can sometimes see that on your property tax bill. And then you'll have the value of your remaining land. And so they typically just have a bulk land rate. For math ease, I sometimes just say, oh, you know, maybe your two acre house site is valued at $50,000 for the two acres and the rest of your land is all valued at $1,000 an acre. So, and then that $1,000 is replaced by whatever the use value is for your number of ag acres and forest acres. And so, Henry said he had a beautiful, you know, maple saw logs, but then he said, wait, I'm gonna go in the direction of maple syrup. <coughs> Does that change because it, its designation went from agricultural or oh. forest land to agricultural? Yeah, so again, it's what your map says. So do you have it enrolled as Sugarbush Ag? And Sugarbush is a great example. Sugarbush, the landowner, can choose to enroll it as agricultural land because annual maple product is right. an ag use, or the landowner can choose to enroll it as forest land. So they can have sugar bush forest, has a better use value rate for the landowner if it's forest land, but you also have the cost of preparing that management plan. So that's the owner's choice. We don't care whether you enroll it as sugar bush ag or sugar <coughs> bush forest. And it's also to the landowner's advantage because if they're sort of at that in between of meeting the 25 acres in one category or another, they can choose how to use that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Can I ask one more? Please. <laughs> I, just, I just wondered if there were discussions at, at PBR and, and current use of whether this current use program would count as a, as a payment for ecosystem services. Say, say that last bit again. Sorry. <laughs> if current use, the program, since when did it start? 1979, and the first payment was made in 1980. Would it be? considered a payment for ecosystem services, which is what we're talking a lot about in here because it's what it's done, right? The management side of it seems like you can make a good case that it is. I'm just thinking yeah. going forward of making payments to pay farmers if they would qualify if they've been in this program. Um, I would, I haven't thought about it so off the cuff. Um, I, I might say no, because we're not actually making a payment to anyone. It's a tax forgiveness program, but it could be your point of view, right? Uh, um, in the early years of the program, the, it was structured slightly differently because the towns administered the program and the state just dealt with the payments. So there was more of a payment functionality back then. Um, I, I don't, you know, I'm sure an economist could make an argument either way. Yeah, I was just going to add, I, you know, we are focused on administering the program as it's <coughs> out for us. So we actually don't try to sort of debate the larger merits <laughs> much. Um, yeah, so we sort of bear witness to things and so we can provide that information. And that's why, so for instance, you know, the land use change tax, it's sort of in, in our little, like little universe, that's something we, we manage it every day and we deal with that. Um, but I would not, I, I don't think that we would be qualified to talk about ecological service. So. Representative Rice, <clears throat> can you talk about how the the new reserve forest program how, how that will look different or the same as the current? I'm going to say that if you would like to really understand that, you should invite Forest Parks and Recreation in to talk about that. Uh, Keith Thompson and Danny Fitzko, who's the new interim commissioner, are excellent sources of information on that, and they're more up to date than I am. I'm following their lead in getting our systems ready to accommodate what they've identified technically as, as what that's gonna look like. So, so I'm gonna pass. Well, we will definitely invite uh, Commissioner Fitzko in to talk about that. And who else did you say might be? Keith Thompson, <laughs> who works for the commissioner. Okay. So it's essentially a new treatment category. Well, it's not new, it was in there, but not to the level that it is. And it has very specific parameters that FPR will review and allow that enrollment. So. We wouldn't get it till it's already gone through their review. Right. And it doesn't have a different use value rate or anything okay. like that. It's the same use value as the other forest land. And, and this is just, it's not clear for, for newer members. Last year, the legislature enacted, changed the statute that would create this new third category. Uh, it's actually just a subset of forest land. Subset, okay. Uh, yeah. the for, of the forest land, okay. Yeah. Um, that subset, does that in some cases exempt uh, forest land owners from uh, having to follow a management plan? As, as I understand it, and FPR can more fully explain it, 
even if you have reserved forest land, you must have a management plan that's reviewed and approved by the county forester. So the same process applies if you have a reserved forest land versus productive forest land. Okay, and then just a follow-up. So everyone in this committee understands the, you know, 50% of your income in agricultural productive land has to come from the farm. But with forest land, there's no such uh, requirement. Correct. There's no such requirement. And also keeping in mind that that 50% of the gross income from the business of farming is only to enroll farm buildings or less than 25 acres of ag land. Okay. So the example I use, I date myself a bit, but you know, you could be the vice president at IBM and have land enrolled in current use in the agricultural program if you had 30 acres. So anyone... Oh, Anyone can have land enrolled in the agricultural category as long as it's an active agricultural use and it's more than 25 acres. So it doesn't matter how you earn your income if it's more than 25 acres. Income only matters if it's less than 25 acres or if you want to enroll your farm buildings. Thank you. Representative Graham. So I'm in the process of trying to take a few acres out and if I take the five acres out that I'm looking for, I still own 300 acres plus. But they're telling me I have to submit my income taxes to prove I'm a qualified firm. Um, do you have farm buildings enrolled? No. Yeah, so it's probably... Um, we try um, and have a routine review when the opportunity presents itself to review farm income uh, because it is a significant benefit of having your farm buildings enrolled um, that you pay no taxes on it. So we don't currently have a, oh, we're going to review everybody on a routine basis. But uh, when there are changes that happen to the property, we take that opportunity to take a look at them. Representative Levitt. Um, can NRCS help with creating a management plan or is that because you all have been talking about legal fees and in my property, we, we only have 10 acres, but we're, we're applying for a grant for man and they're actually help. They're pretty much writing our management plan. You're talking about for agricultural. Yeah. Yeah. So agricultural land does not require a management plan. You just have to have the map and certify that it's an active agricultural use. Okay. You only have to have a management plan for forest land for the current use enrollment. You may need to have a management plan for agricultural purposes, for okay. other reasons, for right. other programs through the agency of ag or through NRS if you have a special grant. But the current use program does not require a management plan for agricultural land. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> you discussed uh, taking land out of current use. Doesn't the program time out after 10 years? So you're, you're permanently in use. You are in current use until you the landowner chooses to come out or we determine that you're no longer eligible. Maybe you cut contrary to your forest management plan and then you're going to come out you, even if you want to stay in. Right. So no, the, there's no time out or re-upping in current use. Mm -hmm. there, um, there was back in the 80s that it was a reapply, and those of you who have been in the program for a longer time may remember every year filling out the forms, that no longer happens. You're in the program until you're out. So, um, okay, I think that answers my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. did, did I see that there's a distinction between withdrawal, withdrawing and developing? <laughs> so so you, you're charged yeah. the uh, penalty if you develop, but you can withdraw and, and not develop? Correct. Um, uh, examples of that. So uh, we will always calculate, and the statute requires this, we always calculate the tax at the time the land comes out of enrollment, but the tax is only due if the land is developed or if the owner wishes to remove the lien. So um, an example that I sometimes see is, say you have 50 acres enrolled in the program, you're a qualified farmer, so you have um, 40 acres in forest land and 10 acres of agricultural land. And because you earn your income from farming, that 10 acre is qualified. You sell it to somebody new, they're not a qualified farmer. Uh, that 10 acres 
unless they lease it to someone, is not going to qualify to be enrolled. So it needs to come out of the program because it doesn't meet those minimums and it doesn't meet any of the economic criteria. So we're going to take that 10 acres out of enrollment. We're going to ask the town to determine the value of that 10 acres. We determine the land use change tax. We tell the owner what that land use change tax is and we tell them this is not due because you've not developed the land and the lien continues on that 10 acres. They don't receive current use benefits on the 10 acres, but that money is not due. So you're no longer eligible for the current use tax rate, but you're not penalized as long as you don't develop, as long as you don't develop it. Right. And a lot of, you can imagine there's a lot of those that we are tracking that they're in that withdrawn but not developed status. So there is a contingent lien on that property. It might be changing hands. It might be out there for years. The folks are paying paying that for a property tax value. But um, then if you go to sell it, for example, and the title attorney is doing the job right, they would find, oh, there is still this contingent lien. And if you want that lien off, you do have to pay that land change tax. But it's not like it's accruing penalty and interest unless there was involvement. Uh, Representative Rice and then Representative <clears throat> So just to make sure I understand, the if, if somebody cuts um, contrary to their plan, they the whole property comes out, but they only owe the tax on the specific acres on which they cut. Yeah, all of the forest land is removed. <laughs> forest land is out for a period of five years, minimum five years, and then they have to apply to come back in. It's not automatically back in. And the tax is only due on the portion that was cut contrary. 50 acre parcel, you cut contrary on 12 acres, the tax will be due on the 12 acres. The remaining 38 acres can is just out for five years. Right. We calculate the tax on the 38 acres in case they wanna pay it, mm -hmm. but they're not required to pay on the 38. But a lien would stay on that. Yes, a lien yeah. stays on that 38 acres until someone pays the tax. And then if you if they decide to come back into enrollment after five years, then there's a new lien that place, is placed upon it because, you know, it's a new application. That new application gets recorded in places that contingent lien on the property to place a prior lien. Do you report annually on how often that happens or the extent to which that happens? The adverse inspection or just people coming out of the program? People people who are not following their plan and are being uh, held accountable. Um, we've not provided that information in the annual report. Um, um, I see some of those. It's not, it's for 19,000 parcels, it's a very small percentage of them. Um, and FPR may be able to provide you more accurate information because those FPR has to report that to us. So it's not the tax department deciding independently that it's an adverse inspection. It's FPR doing that inspection and reporting the findings to us and the landowner. Uh, Reverend Lipsky had a question, unless you had follow up. Just quickly following up on that, is it, um, is it, is this, is it, are they usually complaint driven or is, are there inspections happening? Uh, FPR is the county foresters are required in statute to inspect uh, enrolled forest land parcels at least once every 10 years. So I, sometimes I think it happens as part of the inspection, um, sometimes because the uh, uh, county foresters are living out, um, they're not purely county based anymore, but they're definitely living out in the community. So they may see the log truck going by and go, hmm. Jeff. Thank you. I'm not sure on the calendar, but approximately 10 years ago, some of us who had our ag land in current use, it was maybe it was during the, the big recession a while ago, one of the big recessions. That if you wanted to remove your land, there was going to be a window of no penalty. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. you recall what that year was? Um, there have been, those are uh, colloquially referred to as the easy outs. The, yeah, it was an easy out. Easy outs. <laughs> there have been a number of easy outs over the years. There the were. The most recent one. Uh, there was one in 2015 yeah, when we changed, when the penalty structure was changed to allow people to come out of the program if they wanted to come out. And the requirement was that, that they had to be out for, I can't remember now if it was three years or five years. It's beyond that time frame, so I lost track of what so it was. My, so, and I did that because I had children and I needed to have to give them something. <laughs> well, I still had something. And 
I don't recall having, once you take that easy out path, uh, I, I didn't believe I had to get a rope. That lien disappeared. Uh, it, it did actually. So the it was a one page sheet of paper and you yes. would have said, I want to take out six acres of land and here's my map showing where the six acres of land is. And then we signed the bottom of the form and sent that off to the town clerk to record to release the lien on that six acres. So it would have been a one page sheet, may not have been very memorable. It's a short sheet. It was a short, we tried to keep it easy. Representative O'Bank. I have a Josie inspiring question. Um, or okay. Grand Isle, right? Okay. So <laughs> Josie told us that Grand Isle, the islands are what, 70% ash trees? Yes. So what happens, you can, perhaps going forward, you know, if like emerald ash borer decimates a forest or you know, we have four years of drought in Addison County, or even something simple like a farmer sells their cows, they still have a farm, but, but the land's growing up. Like, what, how is that use value calculated? Because mm. it's so much less than it would have been when they were. Well, the use, mm, I think, so the use value is what's determined by the current use advisory board, but are you saying what the value of the land would be less? Right. Or the crop would be and that too, right? Yeah. So whatever right. money you get from your forest crop is is your business. Um, that doesn't figure into your current use benefits one way or another. Um, but if it's worth worth worthless land, essentially. If it's worthless land, then uh, in essence, if the town values that, so the town would have to value that land lower, right? They would have to say, oh, your land isn't worth a thousand dollars acre anymore. It's only worth five hundred dollars an acre. And maybe the use value is only 300. So then you're only getting $200 per acre of value from your current use enrollment. And um, uh, to be perfectly honest, that's the way it is. And, and we see that across the state because it's a statewide rate, right? Your value of your land in say Woodstock is much different than the value of your land in say Alberg or Derby. And so the the benefit that someone gets varies across the state because it really depends on what is your tax rate in your town and what is the value of your land. And the value of your land can change dramatically too, even within a town. And so it's a statewide rate. And so it, it, it varies. And that's the nature of the program. Quick question. Um, and this might not be, this might not be, this could be the wrong program. But under 10 acres, but let's say you're, you're dealing with getting rid of all of the invasives on your property. Not current use, current use. Because we're, we're trying to get a grant through one of the agencies to because we have so many invasives and we have mm -hmm. so many ash trees. So we're trying to be proactive about having a forest plan. Mm -hmm. So where does that fit in? So because um, I mentioned you guys mentioned invasives. Yeah. So your forest management plan, if you are enrolled in the forest land category, um, I, I don't see a lot of the forest management plans because I don't review them, but occasionally they end up in the mail attached to something. Mm -hmm. and I am curious, so I look at them. Um, <laughs> they can deal with invasive management as part of your forest management plan. Okay. And uh, you know Keith Thompson and Danny Fitzko can give you more information as to what that looks like. And it's really there. And you still have to have either the, the, the 10 or less or the 25 or more. If it's forest land, well, if it's ag land, it has to be an active agricultural use to right. be enrolled, right? Okay. Um, and then if you have a forest management plan, your forest management plan can address invasives as part of managing okay. your overall forest. But it can't, if you have under 10 acres, that's still can't. If you're doing just forest management, that can't get slotted into current use. Um, well, if you qualify as a farmer, and if this was in one of the slides, right, okay. sort of at the bottom, like if, right. if the owner of the land is a qualified farmer, you can enroll less than 25 acres of forest land without a management plan which means you don't have a management plan so you can choose how you want to do that okay but again only if you're a qualified farmer not okay good to know thank you <laughs> is is vermont uh unique in any sense in terms of having a program like this or do other states typically also give tax breaks or incentives there are a lot of versions of this statewide so um just because it's been on my mind, you know, New Hampshire has something similar, but they don't have the withdrawn but not developed. So you're either in or you're out. You pay it when you're out, no matter what, for example. But there's there's variations of this 
nationwide. Yeah, there's California has one. A lot of states have it for agricultural land. The um, Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, which is associated, I think it's the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, um, has published a book on the different uh, use. It's usually for, referred to as a use value appraisal program, not current use. So if you say current use in other states, they don't know what you're talking about. But if you talk about use value appraisal, there's a number of versions of these in different, everybody seems to give it different as how they do it. But the concept is the same, is that you tax the land at the use value instead of the fair market value. And is the, is the use value defined in statute? Do, do we, does the legislature update that or do you update it? The, the current use advisory board determines the use value uh, every year. Uh, based upon uh, calculations that are done by the agency of ag and the department of forest parks and recreation it talks a little bit about that in our annual report um if you um it's it's an average of an average um because we want to sort of it used to be and and i see it used to be that the use value used to do a lot of this uh because it was based for the ag use value was based on milk prices that led to a lot of heartache, both for farmers, depending upon where you are in that, and also for the state for budgeting purposes. Um, so we've moved away from that, and it's been more than 12 years because I, it, since I've been here, we haven't used the milk prices. We now use information from the Na uh, USDA's um, National Agricultural Statistical Service for pasture and crop rental rates form the basis of the ag use value. There's a lot of numbers that go into it. And then for the forest use value, um, it's stumpage value, again, with a lot of numbers going into it, and then some What average. value did you just say? Stumpage? Stumpage. What is that? Just standing timber. OK, it's not just the stump that's left there. Stump. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like the wrong word. It should be like, what they call it. It should be tree value, not stump value. It's technical, it's stumpage, not stump value. Stumpage is, is the word. Oh, stumpage. I've got and it. That's not stumpage. The value of the timber standing on the stump. So, oh, thank you. That makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? It, it just as long as we're being silly here. <laughs> we're talking about uh, the ash dominance in Grand Isle County. What I've dealt with, and some has to do with management plans, some has to do with uh, Act 50. There's a notion of law called an act of God. Let's say you had this pristine forest and a, an extreme storm event occurred and flattened 90% of your stumpage. And I've done a lot of tornado cleanup in Western Pennsylvania, New York State, well, all over. And I mean, the stumps are ripped up too. It's amazing. But you would not be found in violation of your management plan. Just like if the emerald ash borer killed 90% uh, of the crop in Grand Isle County, an extreme weather event would not, you couldn't be removed because you mismanaged it. Right, because that was God managing. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I would say um, that in those cases, like if that's happening and you needed to uh, change how you're managing it because you had a severe storm event, you would contact the county forester uh, through your consulting forester and say, I need to change my management plan because my forest structure has changed dramatically. <laughs> Got it. Right? Because okay. you still have yeah. to figure out how you're going to manage it. What are you going to do now? If you don't have any trees left. Well, right. you no. will have other trees, I hope. Oh. Good call, Chad. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Better Ryan, call Saul. We, we, we're about up at our time. Are, are you able to answer a few more questions, or do you need to? No, I can. Okay. Representative O'Brien. Just, just an equity question. I mean, you don't really deal with policy, but you have to answer to it at some level. So just from what you said, it's costing the state of Vermont a lot more to keep a farm going in stow than it is in New York, right? Because it's that gap between what mm -hmm. the fair market yes. is and the equity is, and it's a statewide right yes. price. So it's one I just never really thought about that. Uh, and, and I would say uh, current use is uh, revenue neutral. It doesn't matter how much money you make, you can be in current use. It doesn't matter if you make nothing or you make millions. That's not the purpose of the program. It's not an income sensitivity program. 
it's a land management program. And that's important to remember. And that's been the policy all along. Representative Temple. So your program um, collects money in conditions of development and then clearly um, uses money to offset people's taxes. Is there an overall income to, to output ratio that, you know, like what the total budget is minus or net minus these returns that you get? Um, well, I, I think the short answer is sort of no. You know, so that that slide I showed earlier about the the right. showing, you know, it's it's sixty five million dollars a year that is not either is is paid out to support the program, the eighteen million that goes for the municipal hold harmless, and then there's forty seven point five million in ed fund revenue that is made up statewide. Um, the land use change tax is a much smaller dollar figure. That's really designed not to be a revenue generator, but to be a penalty. Mm -hmm. And there is uh, some cost sharing of that. We distribute 50% um, of that up to 2,000 to the towns per collected. So, yeah, yeah, and I just pulled up the numbers, which are in our annual report. So land use change tax for 2022 that was assessed so on developed acres, so money that we would be collecting was 1.7 million. Um, if you go back to 2015, um, which was prior to the change of that formula, it was around 400,000. Wow. And again, that's on developed acres. That's not tax on land that's just come out because we, that's just. And that's the only positive flow you're seeing. Um, from a sense of money in your pocket, yes, but um, I'm always, um, I think it's always important to recognize that current use brings a lot of other economic benefits to the state that aren't quantified in a tax department sense, um, but are very important to Vermont's economy. Sure. I don't want to yes. suggest anything else. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, clearly there's a, there's a cost of it. Yeah. Yes. A net cost. Yeah. Great. Well, um, any final questions? I So we will... Uh, definitely have folks in from uh, forestry to tell us more about the new category or subcategory and answer any questions that uh, which in recognizing it hasn't actually started yet but that it's coming along um, and then did you earlier in the presentation suggest that if we wanted to know more about something <laughs> yes thank you back? <laughs> so um for the past, so the, in 2015, the legislature made several significant changes to the program, and one of which led to the easy out. So the land use change tax used to be a pretty straightforward, if you were taking out a portion of the parcel, you prorate that value, and that's what you charge land use change tax. So in 2015, it was changed that you valued that if you pulled out a portion of your enrolled acreage, you're valuing that as a standalone parcel. The idea being, I think, that it was supposed to be a higher penalty. So um, we are seeing that that is a higher penalty, but it is all over the map as far as what that actually is statewide. Um, and the more we sort of crunch the data, the more we can tell that this is, you know, it's an effective tax rate from like 1% to like 800%. Um, some towns have done the value differently where if they're valuing it as a standalone parcel and you've taken out a nice five acre lot on a view shed, then, but it's not, if they're valuing it as landlocked, because it's supposed to be valued as a standalone parcel, then it's actually valued lower. So it's um, basically, we, I first started wanting to do something about it because we were having a hard time getting these values from listers. It's become sort of part of our processes on top of everything else to nag to get these values and to administer this program. The taxpayer has no idea what their um, land use change tax penalty will be until after they've committed to withdrawing that land because it's supposed to be valued at the time it's withdrawn from the program. So you, you used to be able to say, don't want to take five, don't want to take 10. I could take a pretty close stab at what that would be. And that is gone. So we're constantly managing, you know, landowners who have no information about what that penalty will be. Um, so then the more the data folks at the tax department, because we have a really strong brain team up there that deals with data, um, the more it became really clear that this was not fair, this was not equitable, this is not transparent, it's not predictable. Um, and frankly, I think part of the original goal of that change um, was to um, to 
sort of disincentivized fragmentation or changing um, enrollment in the program. And the data doesn't really bear that out one way or the other. It's, you know, the, the, the enrollment is sort of saying kind of slowly creeping up, you know, lands changing hands, some's coming out, some's coming back in. So it also can't really, the data is not showing that it had any demonstrable impact positively or negatively. It's just created confusion and inability for anyone to predict what that's going to be. So we would like to go back to what it was essentially before 2015, where there's a proration. The computer can do that work for us. If you're a landowner, you can take a stab at what your, like, what your bill is going to be and make decisions based on that. Um, and then the second piece of that discussion is if the legislature does want to continue to have it be a higher penalty, we would need to we would need to use a higher tax rate for those prorated pieces. So we're sort of going to, we'd like to come and just talk about what we saw, you know, the impact that's having, um, and those two main factors about the transparency and upfront nature of calculating that. And then do we want to continue to disincentivize smaller pieces or do we, in the in the vein of trying to keep as much land in the program as possible, are we okay with smaller pieces coming out? The rest of it will stay in the program. Um, so that's a long mm -hmm. one to get. I'd love to come Okay, good. Do you have, do you have, are you working on a proposal like language or? Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. So that's something you might want to share with us. Yes. And we sort of continue to try to come up with the right rates for the um, the proration based on the overall acreage that's enrolled versus what's coming out. Because as you can imagine, if you're qualified as a farmer um, under 25 acres and you're taking, you know, five or 10 acres out, that's a pretty huge portion of your value. If you're taking two acres out of a thousand acre parcel, that's pretty tiny. So what is the legislative goal of the, that tax? And then there's different rates we can apply depending on what that would be. Um, so yeah, we continue to kind of fine tune that. but. The more we dug into it, the more we realized we at least needed to come and show you folks what we're seeing as problematic for landowners. And we've got lots of landowners, I think, who would be interested in coming and talking about this. Well, <laughs> please be in touch with Laura and uh, we'll look forward to that. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you very much. For thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> unless anybody has any final thoughts, we'll. I have a, you might know. Yeah. Is there a dedicated funding source to make up for the tax hole between you know, what you would have made a fair market versus you mean use? So you know the state has to come up with money to so that the towns right are paid. So that back. municipal comes out of the general fund it at eighteen general. million. It's not, there's not a you know rooms of meal or property tax or something like that. It's just oh, well. a general fund hole. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, I think in the budget it shows up. It's called the hold harmless payment or municipal hold harmless payment. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I guess we'll break that until uh, two thirty.